Now in 2021, American society is at its most divided in decades. Trust in institutions and politicians is on the wane and political discourse is increasingly combative. What's the solution? Maybe it's comedy. Humor can be a powerful way to counter these trends and find common ground, argues Cappy Magar, a political activist and co-creator of the Kennedy Center Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. Uh, he's written uh, an incredible book titled The Man Who Made Mark Twain Famous. Cappy is an Emmy nominated, is the Emmy nominated co-creator of the Mark Twain Prize uh, and the Library of Car Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song. He's one of the few people to be appointed by multiple presidents to the Kennedy Center. And his writing has been published in the New York Times, Politico, and USA Today. Without further ado, Cappy, tell us about your book. Mike, thank you very much. And it's a real honor and privilege to be here at Perry World House. Uh, I know Michael is, has the Richard Perry seat. What, what do you call that? Professorship, that's good enough. Uh, I'm just a Richard Perry friend uh, since, um, I guess, the late 70s. So I'm very honored to be here. And I know you all talk about world peace and solving the world's problems. So ho hopefully this session will be about humor and fun and funny. I did write this book, The Man Who Made Mark Twain Famous, but the bubble in on the front of the book is stories from the Kennedy Center, the White House, and other comedy venues. Mark Erlickson did my uh, cover. I called him. He's an illustrator who's done over 50 New Yorker magazine covers. And I said, hey, Mark, uh, would you do my cover? He said, well, of course. What's the name of it? He said, I said, The Man Who Made Mark Twain Famous. He said, I got it. Twain sitting in his chair, smoking a cigar, and he's got your framed photograph on the desk. I said, I love it. Ken Burns is a good friend. He wrote the, uh, he wrote the forward. And in his forward, he says, uh, Cappy name drops, picks the names back up and then shamelessly drops them again. So I thought that was really a nice friend, a friendly thing to say. And uh, to paraphrase Huckleberry Finn, this book was made by Mr. Cappy McGar and he tells the truth mainly. So I'd like to get into my preamble. When I began telling people that I was writing a book about my life and the Mark Twain Prize for Humor, there's one question I get more than any other. Do you have any other book recommendations? The second question is usually, why? Not too long ago, a rabbi friend of mine shared some wisdom from the Talmud. To live a full life, man must plant a tree, have a child, and write a book. Well, having metaphorically planted trees in finance and having raised my children, I was inspired by this quote to complete the set and thereby live a tumultuously full life. So I dug deep in my memories and conjured up stories through my life, my former days at the University of Texas to Goldman Sachs, to building lifelong relationships with national politicians, getting a board appointed to the board of the Kennedy Center by two different presidents, to the creation of the exec and, and the execution of the Mark Twain Prize. I've met a ton of wonderful people and I'm gonna tell you about them all right here. Still, it's a careful balance to strike. I've read books about self-important business figures that come across like an excuse to list off celebrities they've met and fund a couple of Lamborghinis. I have no intention of doing that. Sure, I could brag about the relationships I developed over the years with political titans such as Lloyd Benson, Tom Daschle, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. Barack Obama, but that would be gauche. And I could regale you with all the times I've rubbed elbow, elbows with entertainment stars like Tina Fey and Bill Murray and Eddie Murphy and Mel Brooks and Aretha Franklin, Paul McCartney, but I would hate to name drop. Plus, I'd feel remiss if I bought a luxury car this vehicle, uh, this day and age, and it didn't go American, so no Lamborghinis. In all seriousness, I realize that any memoir requires some delusion of grandeur from its author, but the best I can I've tried not to make this book about me, instead about the value humor can bring to politics and life in general. The way differences can be bridged by a funny story or a silly impression. There's joy when comedians make politicians laugh and vice versa. The way I see it in Washington, there, are no, there aren't enough funny people and there are too many jokes. So I'll do my damnedest to bring a lighthearted approach, humorous approach to my family and to Washington. That's why the Mark Twain Prize is so important. It's an annual reprieve in the nation's capital from the severity of the news and a chance to celebrate people who keep our spirits up in the face of challenges and an opportunity to remind us, our leaders, not to take themselves too seriously. 
The journey to make the Mark Twain Prize happen has been quite a ride, and it's come with a, very, a fair bit of surprises. None more shocking than when the same rabbi friend called me to sheepishly admit he discovered that that quote he had shared with me wasn't from the Talmud at all. It was Shemuggin, which is Yiddish for malarkey, which is Biden for bullshit. But it was too late. I'd already started writing my book. And if I don't know what's funny, I don't know what is. So I hope that you get a chance to read the book. And uh, I really, again, appreciate being here. And Mike, I guess you're going to come up and we're going to continue the conversation. All right. The Mark Twain Prize is supposed to be about funny people. Are you a funny person? And what made you think you could pull it off? On my tombstone, it's going to say he thought he was taller, not he thought he was funny. Uh, I mean, I do have the ability to make people laugh, and so I really enjoyed it. I, when I graduated from uh, college, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, and my mentor said, uh, I'd like to go to L.A. And, and, and try it out. And he goes, no, you'll end up in some ditch on drug overdose. And you'll be dead, and so go get your MBA. And so I did that. So tell me about the, what, one of the things that I think is remarkable about your life that comes through in the conversation, that comes through in the book, is the way that your life has been full, basically, of these two things, of politics and, and of humor. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your, your sort of theory of humor and politics, basically? You know, you, you talk a little bit in the book about the notion of, of humor as something that can bring us together. You know, do you do you really believe that? And and what's the role of humor in politics? I absolutely believe humor is a incredible salve uh, for the difficulties that we all live in. And humor's been with us since the beginning of mankind. <clears throat> humor's important if you're married or you have a partner. Uh, if you get in a difficult situation, the, the way to kind of break the ice is humor. When you're a CEO giving a speech, if you do self-effacing humor to begin the speech, uh, your the audience is going to like you more. Uh, if you're a politician, that is even more true. And almost every politician that's worth anything starts with some self-effacing humor. Uh, you know, in the last uh, four years of uh, the last administration, there was not a lot of humor because I don't didn't think that the guy in the Oval Office had self-effacing humor. I think if he'd have done that, maybe we'd have thought a little bit differently about him. So could... You know, we, we exist in this, this polarized world in America today where, where it feels like Democrats and Republicans have never been as, as far apart as they are. The, you know, you've had these two different parts of your lives, you know, in, in, in a way. You know, in the, in the book, for example, you talk about the, the, you know, your experiences in, in democratic politics, you know, starting with LBJ right. uh, in a way. And, you know, and then also, of course, you know, the, the focal point of the book are all these incredible comedians that you you've had the opportunity to work with as part of the, as part of the prize. Is there, is there a secret sauce there to, for humor as a way to overcome some of the, the divisions that we face? I think it's been true uh, throughout history that, that uh, humor brings, brings a laugh. We, we like to laugh. Uh, we don't have enough joy in our life. And when you go to Washington now, and you're absolutely right, Mike, it is, uh, very disturbing about the polarization of politics. And, and uh, I mean, we, that's one of the reasons we have the Mark Twain Prize and we started it is so we can honor one person once a year that brings joy in, in our life and brings uh, humor in our life. And so, uh, yeah, humor is incredibly important and we don't see enough of it. We don't use enough of it, but who doesn't, who doesn't like to laugh? And we all like to laugh. We all like to laugh. We all, you know, we don't like to cry much, but we like to laugh. And so that's why I think uh, laughter and humor is, is so important in our lives. So where did the idea then for the Mark Twain Prize you know, come from? You just like wake up one day in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, wow, what we really need is a humor prize at the Kennedy Center. And, and 
did you think about naming it after anybody else? Um, I didn't want to name it after me, Mike. I, that'd be, that would be not. You could have named it after me. You could have named it after your friend Richard. We're not going to name it after Richard. He is very funny, though. People don't know that, but Rich is very funny. Uh, no, uh, three guys. Uh, He's literally uh, never been called Rich in this building before. Say it again? He's never been called Rich in this building before. Nobody's called Richard or Mr. Perry or Sir Perry or Lord Perry. I mean, what do y'all call him? Uh, Perry of the house. <laughs> you know, I've got a coffee shop at the University of Texas named after me. I don't have a world Perry house. I may change my coffee shop to Cappy's World Coffee Shop. Uh, no, uh, three guys went into the, uh, to the uh, White House to talk to the social secretary. Her name is Ann Stock. John Schreiber, uh, Mark Krantz, and Murray Horowitz. It's actually Murray Horowitz's idea. He's very well known to being on NPR. He's been on NPR for many, many decades, by the way. And Ann Stock said, we're not being very funny around here. It was during the President Clinton administration. And uh, because there was a crisis that we don't need to go into, but there was a crisis in the Clinton administration at that time. She said, but I'm going to go to the Kennedy Center and be in charge of institutional uh, relations, which means dealing with the Congress. Come on up come on over and give us the idea at the Kennedy Center, see if the comedy show uh, has any merit. And so uh, we all went and the, that, the day they had that meeting in the president's office at the Kennedy Center uh, was a board meeting. And uh, Larry Wilker was the president at the time and he knew of my background in comedy and I had a radio program and did voices and impressions. That's how I worked my way through business school. And uh, he and said, Captain, kind of awesome. join us. And so, uh, we came there and uh, talked about what, who we named the award after. Mark Twain was our very first uh, stand-up comedian, if you will. They didn't call it anything like that back then. He'd had all of his money. He'd made all of his money in uh, Huckleberry Finn and uh, Tom Sawyer and uh, invested incredible, mostly all of his money in this type printing press. And it was a complete, utter failure, and he lost all of his money. So in order to make money and to provide money for his family, he went throughout the United States to these uh, theaters, movie theaters and auditoriums and just talked, kind of like Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, he, Jerry Seinfeld does the Mark Twain uh, bit very, very well. Uh, Twain was very critical and very funny of, uh, of Congress. And uh, so that was a very obvious choice for us to name it uh, the, the prize after Mark Twain. So that first year, to answer, fully answer your question, uh, we honored Richard Pryor. And Richard Pryor, not many people know this, but Richard Pryor wrote, uh, co-wrote Blazing Saddles with Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks asked him, he wanted, to, he wanted Richard Pryor to play uh, Black Bart, but they couldn't insure him because of Richard's drug abuse. But he would have been a great, uh, Cleavon Little was spectacular, but Richard Pryor would have been great. And Richard Pryor was a great choice because he had so much influence on all the comedians that followed him. And it was a hard sell. Uh, he was in a wheelchair. He had terrible MS because of some issues that in his past. And uh, uh, Janie and I, my wife and I, bought a third of the auditorium out because we, we just couldn't sell it. And it was a great lineup. We had Harry Belafonte and Gene Wilder and Whoopi Goldberg. How could you not sell it? Like, that's, that's epic. Um, kind of the first, the, the first of anything is kind of a tough go. And, uh, but anyway, everybody got up and, Harry Belafonte started it and said, you know, Mark Twain would have been so happy to have Richard Pryor win the first Mark Twain prize. And Whoopi Goldberg said the same thing. Gene Wilder, they all said the same thing. And then Chris Rock, who had just gotten off of Saturday Night Live, was one of the top comedians in the world. He still is. Uh, he gets up there and he says, I've heard all this MFBS, all MF night. I'm so sick of hearing this. Mark Twain would have been so proud of, Rich, of Richard Pryor getting the first Mark Twain prize. That's the biggest bunch of MFBS I've ever heard in my life. He'd say, say in, take my MF bag upstairs right now. Huge laughter erupted in the Kennedy Center concert hall. Uh, unfortunately, the board of the Kennedy Center was in the row ahead of, I couldn't see their expressions, but uh, we had the executive committee meeting the next morning and Jim Johnson, who was chairman, said, Kathy, give us a report. And I said, well, we lost $100,000. Uh, but I really think that this could be really something the Kennedy Center would really enjoy. And there was discussion back and forth. But uh, Jean Kennedy Smith was ambassador to Ireland and she was on the board of the Kennedy Center and she flew back for the board meeting. And there was back and forth and back and forth. And so Jim held a vote. 
and it was great. Only one person voted against it, Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith. Okay, well, that's okay. I'm sorry she voted against it. So we're walking to the board meeting, and Jim said, I'm so sorry, Cappy, the Mark Twain Prize is dead. I said, well, Jim, I mean, we had one negative vote. He goes, Cappy, that's John Kennedy's sister. If she votes- it's like kind it, of a thing. It's kind of a deal. If she votes against it, it's not gonna happen. So I made a beeline to, to, to the ambassador, and I said, ambassador, uh, you know, I know you voted no. And I don't know why you voted no, but I'd really wish you'd change your mind. She said, my brother would have been horrified with the N word and the F word said on the stage bearing his name. And I said, well, Gene, I could not agree with you more. I, I agree. I said, but your brother stood for great humor, wit, and charm. And I think he would have been very happy with the laughter that broke, on, broke out on the stage bearing his name. She said, well, let me think about it. And then I said, well, Eugene will, will honor you know, Carl Reiner, Dick Van Dyke, I named a whole bunch of people that I thought that she might like. And she said, let me think about it. So long story short, she changed her vote and, and uh, we now, it makes over two and a half million dollars for the uh, Kennedy Center every year. Not bad. It's pretty good. So what has it been like over the, over the, the period of time that the Mark Twain Prize has been given? You know, you've had a chance to see you know, to, to meet and, 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 you know, get to hang out with, you know, these, you know, incredible comedians, you know, people like, uh, you know, like Bill Murray or, you know, Steve Martin, the, like for anyone that's seen uh, Only Murders in the Building, the, the, like what Steve Martin can do from a physical comedy perspective when he's like older than my parents is like unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't do that. I never could. But anyway, who, who's the funniest person? that you dealt with in the context of, dealt with is the wrong way to say that, but that you've you know, worked with in the context of the prize. Not who's the funniest prize winner, but who's the funniest person that you've, you've worked with? Um, it, it's a toss up between Eddie Murphy and, uh, and Bill Murray, uh, the, the funniest person that I've ever met and ever dealt with. And he's my comedic hero is Mel Brooks. And he's told us, turned us down many, many times. But Eddie Murphy is nice. He's hilarious. Uh, I took him into the Oval Office to meet President Obama. And President Obama says, uh, Eddie, you and I are the same age. Uh, you have no gray hair, and I've got a lot of gray hair. And so Eddie says, well, Mr. President, you know, you've got a very stressful job, you know, and President of the United States, most powerful leader in the world. And all I do is make people laugh. So the President Obama looks at me, and he goes, uh, Cappy, I'm funny, aren't I? I said... Yes, Mr. President, you are really funny. <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, and he, and I've got good timing, don't I? I was, Mr. President, you've got perfect timing. The president took us into the uh, situation room, which we had spectacular, uh, uh, met these young kids. Uh, they all got up, and Eddie Murphy said, sit down. We'll have, I'm going to go around and meet all of y'all. said, I don't want the world to blow up. And the situ I don't know if many of you people have seen the situation room, but it's a pretty amazing, uh, small, very small room. And that afternoon, uh, I took Eddie and his family uh, on a tour of the White House, uh, the main White House. And so Eddie is standing in front of the Ronald Reagan portrait, and I'm standing behind him. And I go, this is right before the Hillary Clinton uh, Trump election in November. And I go, well, Eddie, welcome to the White House. Mommy and I are glad to have you here. Just don't rearrange the furniture. He turned around. He goes, ah, that's a really good Reagan. Do you do any more? I said, well, I'll do Carter. He said, well, Carter's my very first impression. I said, well, let me hear it. He goes, he does a great Carter, better than mine. So he said, let me hear your Carter. I go, well, the White House is a great example for Habitat for Humanity. He says, that's really good to do anymore. I said, well, I'll do Clinton. He said, well, let me hear it. I went, I hope Hillary wins. I'll be interviewing interns. <clears throat> um, so we bonded. And the next night, I'm emceeing the cast dinner at the Smithsonian and introducing Dave Chappelle and Trevor Noah and others. Uh, and uh, so after everybody gives their toast and roast to Eddie, I said, Eddie, come on up. We got a gift for you. Uh, it was a Mark Twain book, first edition, first edition Twain. And he jumps on stage. He gives me this great hug, uh, hug. And there's a great picture in the, in the book with Eddie pointing to me. He goes, Cappy's really funny. does great impressions. I'm going to go down to my table. Call me back up as Reagan. Now, I worked on my remarks like for a month. And I have help, 
I mean, I work on my timing. I, you know, I, I call Richard. I said, you know, Rich, uh, you know, does, is this funny? He goes, no. So then I go back to the drawing board. I mean, what does he know really? Uh, and then I, uh, uh, but he jumped off the stage and went back to his table. And I went, well, you know, when mommy and I were in the White House, we traded places just like you did in that movie. Come on up, we got a little gift for you. Of course, everybody went crazy and, you know, laughed a lot. But uh, it's moments like that you have to pinch yourself. Am I really, is this really happening to me? The other one is uh, Bill Murray. And uh, Bill is, Bill and I have uh, stayed friends since we honored him at the uh, Mark Twain Prize. He actually wrote a blurb uh, on the back of the book. Uh, I identified Ken Burns. He wrote this very nice blurb. He goes, America's foremost documentary filmmaker. So I called Bill. I said, hey, Bill, listen, I'd like you to write a blurb for me. He goes, yeah, well, okay, I don't know. I said, let me send you the manuscript. He goes, okay. I said, will you read it? He goes, probably not. And I said, uh, yeah. well, look, I got a deadline in a week from today. And I said, if you'll do me a blurb, I'd appreciate it. He says, uh, well, okay. And so the Thursday before the Friday deadline, I sent him all the blurbs, Lily Tomlin, David Rubenstein, Carol King, and Ken Burns. So Bill writes back, wait, is America's foremost documentary filmmaker already taken? So I identified him as Bill Murray's America's second foremost documentary filmmaker in the Kennedy Center honor, uh, I mean, the Kennedy Center uh, 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 Mark Twain Prize recipient. All right, Steel Cage Comedy Showdown, who wins, Bill Murray or Eddie Murphy? That's a real tough question. Uh, they're both incredibly funny. I'm not going to answer that, Mike. What a, what a I, terrible question to put me on the spot like that. They're both You funny. wrote a whole book about comedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Murray does not have an agent or a, or a our publicity person, he's got a 800 number. And so if you want to get in touch with him, you have to call the 800 number and you leave a voicemail. Is it the Ghostbusters line? Uh, no, but almost, but he's got a lawyer. And so Kennedy Center president sent the lawyer and a nice letter, Bill Murray, would you please take the Mark Twain prize and a very long letter of who's won, won it? Nothing, zero crickets. And so uh, I was, uh, they said, look, we have to move on. I said, no, I'd like to, Try one more thing. So I got a friend of mine who lives out in California. His name is uh, Craig Johnson. He plays uh, in the Pro-Am, uh, Pebble Beach Pro-Am with Bill Murray. I said, hey, Craig, will you ask Bill Murray about this Mark Twain Prize? He said, yeah, send me one sentence or two sentences, no more. I said, okay. So I said, Bill, will you take the Mark Twain Prize for humor? Happy. And I get this email back, uh, text back. He goes, I guess so. And so then I, I still don't have Better Bill. Than I still don't have Bill's uh, at that moment. They don't have his email or his cell phone. So I emailed Craig. I said, Craig, look, I got to take Bill. I'm going to take Bill to the Oval Office to meet the president. Uh, I need his, please have him call me. So Bill calls me and he says, listen, here's my email and here's my uh, telephone. If you tell anybody about either one of those, uh, then I have to have you killed. I went, oh, okay, Bill. Uh, but anyway, so the White House called about two weeks before he we went to the Oval Office and said, would Bill do an Affordable Health Care Act uh, PSA, public service announcement? And so I emailed Bill and said, he said, yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. He said, but I want no script. I'll do it ad lib. I said, okay. So we're in the, in the, uh, we're in the uh, cabinet room and this young kid comes in and says, uh, President Obama's uh, waiting for you and uh, uh, Bill, here's a script. Bill looks at me and he goes, Cappy, I said, no script. I said, yes, you're right. Tell the president, no script. He's going to ad lib. And the, this young kid runs out of the room. He comes running back in. He goes, the president's okay with that. I said, well, he would be. Anyway, we get in. We take the photo ops of the Twain uh, bust, which is a, a bronze bust about this big and heavy. And then they start doing the Affordable Health Care Act. And uh, so the president says, look, here's a putter. I've got a putter. And uh, we're going to put a ball into a glass or to a cup. And, uh, and we'll, you know, that'll be the routine. And I'll ask you about the Affordable Health Care Act. Bill said, great. So the president puts down a paper cup. Bill says, I'm not putting into that. I want a glass cup. 
president said, why? I said, because when you hit it into a paper cup, it goes thud. When you hit it into a glass cup, it goes ding. So the president yells out for a glass. So he put it down. The president says, I bet you a dollar a hole. Bill says, okay, you're on. So he's putting in. Bill puts every one of them in. The president misses every one of them. But in the meantime, Bill starts limping. And the president said, are you okay? He said, no, I got something wrong with my knee and my hip. It's just acting up. He said, well, do you have health insurance? Bill said, you know, I don't. He said, well, you know, you can sign up for the Affordable Health Care Act. He said, oh, really? And he gave, gives him the website and he goes, and Bill pauses and says, uh, does that include mental issues too? <laughs> Only as Bill and Murray can, can say. Uh, but anyway, so that uh, got a huge amount of uh, views on, uh, as you can imagine, having Bill Murray do the, the Obamacare PSA. It's pretty funny, actually. The, so the one of the turning back to or actually a little a little more on uh, on, on Washington in this context and the 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 White House uh, you know press corps the the correspondence banquet for for years was uh, and this is, comes from somebody in the uh, uh, somebody online the you know for years was this kind of lighthearted way it seemed like to diffuse tension in in you know in Washington where the you know, the president would tell Joe was somebody would write jokes for the president who then like attempts to deliver them uh, right. effectively uh, with varying success. And the, the, you know, everybody has a, every, you know, everybody has a good time and, you know, maybe goes about their business of, of like yelling at each other the next day, but it's a, you know, sort of like a day of, of, of levity. Uh, I guess there are two, uh, uh, you know, picking up on, on this, this, this piece that somebody online uh, mentioned, you know, one is, is that an example of, of sort of comedy bringing us together, I guess, and, you know, the way that you would kind of think about? And, and is that, and is there any hope now for that dinner, which? Well, they say they're going to do it again. I don't know if they'll have another uh, 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 comedian to do it, but, you know, some of the comedians in the past 10 years got in some trouble by doing some politically incorrect, uh, uh, you know, comedy that w was very funny, but didn't really kind of might have crossed the line. But the most famous White House Correspondents' Dinner ever in the history of Correspondents' Dinners when Barack Obama made fun of Donald Trump. And a lot of people say that the reason Donald Trump ran for president is because he was made fun of in a very public setting uh, that Barack Obama made fun of him. So, you know, I do hope they do have, uh, they, they will have a, a, a White House Correspondents' Dinner. I, I do hope they bring comedians back because it is a way to, you know, Nancy Reagan uh, had an incredible uh, bit when she did, uh, I, I think it was the White House Correspondents' Dinner, but she made a, she was being criticized as being, you know, too extravagant and buying expensive china and doing all this. And so she dressed up in rags and sang secondhand rows. And that's a great example of how a politician, particularly, uh, obviously, a first lady like Nancy Reagan, can disabuse people of the fact that, yes, she is a real person. She can laugh at herself. And that really is the essence of, 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 of humor in politics is the ability to have self-effacing humor and be able to laugh at yourself. All right. Do you think Biden's funny? I do. I was at the White House this last weekend uh, and uh, we were at the, for the Kennedy Center Honors. I'm on the Honor Selection Committee and we honored Lauren Michaels. And so uh, President Biden uh, said, uh, Lauren, I really appreciate you being here. Congratulations on winning the honor. You're having a little difficult time. You got seven people trying to impersonate me. Steve Martin was in the audience. He gets up and goes, I can impersonate him. And so that brought a huge laugh. But Biden does have a sense of humor. Biden's a, you know, great guy, uh, you know, a big hugger, as obviously he's famous for, but uh, no, he does have a sense of humor about himself. Barack Obama has a great, you know, George W. Bush, he's an incredibly funny president. I mean, he was a, he has a really, really good sense of humor. So did his dad. Uh, so you go back in history, look at presidential humor. Um, you know, the president's lucky if he's able to make peace. He's got writers, but obviously if he's able to do self-effacing humor about himself, people tend to like him a little bit more. Now I know you 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 spent a lot of time with uh, with LBJ when you were when you were younger. Right. The uh, funny. I never was around President Johnson when he was funny. I was his aide or gopher at the Civil Rights Symposium a month before he died, 
and it was an incredible experience for me. Um, you know, you know, go get my speech and uh, do this, do that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, during that time, Hubert, everybody in the civil rights movement came. Uh, Andrew Young, uh, uh, Chief, former Chief Justice Earl Warren was there, gave a keynote address. Hubert Humphrey was there. And Hubert, uh, uh, Vice President Humphrey, former Vice President Humphrey, then Senator Humphrey, had a stomach virus. <clears throat> and so President Johnson said, go find Hubert. We're going to lunch. And I want him here now. Yes, sir. I mean, I almost had to change my clothes, but uh, so I'm knocking on bathroom doors and finally the second one in the green room. I said, Mr. Vice President, he said, yes, yes, I'm here. And I said, well, the president wants you. He said, I'm busy. And so that was a crisis avoided when he came out and I rushed him to the, uh, rushed him to the car where Johnson was waiting for him. Johnson hurled some expletive leading at him saying, God damn it, Hubert, get in the car. We're going to lunch. And the lunch literally was on, you know, about 30 feet away. So I'm not sure why they, Johnson did that, but I'm a, a, on the board of the LBJ Foundation. I'm a great admirer of President Johnson's. And uh, yes, Vietnam is an issue, but uh, his great society programs are still discussing today. Medicare, Medicaid, civil rights, voting rights. You go down the list, uh, uh, NPR, pub public broadcasting, um, NEA, NEH, I mean, you just go down the list of all the things. We're still discussing those issues today. So he's, I think, one of the most consequential presidents we've ever had. By the way, my picture was in every paper in the country. The last day we were listening to Earl Warren and President Johnson sitting in the end, Lady Bird sitting in the middle, and I'm sitting on the other side of Lady Bird. Johnson's got this hair that flips up in his collar, and he's got these incredible cowboy boots on. And so the Houston Chronicle was nice enough to identify the, or had a caption that says, President Mrs. Johnson in an unidentified aide. I'm still so mad about that. Anyway, I, that's the name of the chapter, unidentified aide. That's great. The, so the, you know, the Mark Twain Prize hasn't, yes. been, hasn't been given in a couple of years. So do you think, is it, is, is it coming back? It, it, it will be back uh, April 24th. We didn't have it last year because of COVID. Uh, our last recipient was uh, Dave Chappelle. So that was... Can, can you give us a little hint about this year? No. But it's funny. He'll be a funny... He's a funny person. All right. Well, you told us gender then. Yes, it's a he. All right. I feel like we're making progress here. We, we got, <laughs> we got like, I got like 20 more minutes to break him down. <laughs> The, <laughs> all right, the uh, last question before we, uh, we turn to the audience and to, uh, to ask a question, you know, as I mentioned, use the, use the Q&A uh, in the Zoom interface and those questions are being fed to me on stage or you can uh, go over the mic there and ask a question. Uh, please be uh, distanced and respectful, uh, obviously, uh, as you uh, do so. Uh, all right, you wrote a book. Right. What's the next? Let me ask you the same question every professor gets asked all the time, whether it's their parents, a tenure review committee, whatever. What's the next book? Uh, the next book is gonna be a series of children's books, I think. Uh, Admiral McRaven uh, famously uh, designed in the capture of, uh, in strategy to capture Osama bin Laden and kill him. So bin Laden killing as a children's? No, he, uh, uh, Mac, Admiral McRaven wrote a book on leadership and the elements of leadership, whether it be courage, honesty, et cetera. And my, I have two grandchildren. One is named Annette Cap. Yes, I got honorable mention. And uh, my grandson is named Hudson. And uh, so I'm gonna write a book called Princess Little Cap and Sir Hud the Brave. And uh, it's gonna be the elements of Mac Raven's book. And Sir Hud the Brave is, he's three years old, by the way. He's not so brave because he doesn't like dragons. There's a big dragon that's taken over the kingdom. And, you know, I don't have just thinking about it. So anybody got any ideas on storyline, you know, let me know. But I'm hoping to write some children's books. All right. Now, uh, you, everyone's been very patient. I want to want to turn it over to the audience. So if people uh, want to ask questions, please uh, uh, walk up and um, uh, and ask things. Uh, please, uh, uh, as a reminder, to be just like our online chat to um, please keep it clean and safe for work and uh, whatever you uh, whatever you ask. I mean, I will 
go to online question first. I, I, I prefer to favor the people that, that you're actually here in person. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you've talked about how self-effacing humor and being able to laugh at yourself can help sort of maybe bridge divides. Um, one of the challenges I think of the current moment is that, as you noted um, in several of your other comments, that sometimes humor doesn't sit well with anyone. And so is there a sense in which humor today can actually promote divisions because people are viewing the humor through with different expectations or you know, they're primed for animosity? And so do you see humor as sometimes working to promote polarization rather than depolarization? If I understand your question, it is the um, does some humor cross the line, and is humor does humor cause a lot of consternation? And I think the best example of that, I actually wrote an op-ed in the USA Today about three or four weeks ago on, on Dave Chappelle. And Dave Chappelle, I don't know how many people have seen the last uh, Netflix special called "The Closer" of Dave Chappelle. Uh, I thought it was incredibly funny. It was also maybe a little bit uh, maybe a little bit creepy and a little bit nervous at, at times. But Dave Chappelle uh, is an incredibly funny person. He's also a very thoughtful person. And if you actually saw that show and all the criticism about what he said about trans people, I thought was well over across the line. What he said, the funniest thing he said, by the way, in that whole episode or that whole uh, uh, Netflix series was, I don't hate trans people. I just hate white people. I mean, that's funny. Uh, it's funny this, when Chappelle said the trans, the trans uh, that came to him, the trans woman that came to him wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And he said, okay, you can, you can open for me. And he, she, he said, she said, great. And so she opened for him and she bombed. And so Dave worked with her and, and said, I'm going to help you become a better stand-up comedian. And he said, you can open for me down the road like a month from now or whatever. I can't remember exactly the time period. So she opens for him again, and she bombs again. She had a daughter, and the story is that she took her own life, uh, you know, months later, and they set up a trust fund for his daughter, and when she turns 18, she's going to get a, quite a bit of money. And so I think that uh, my op-ed, the essence of my op-ed, leave Dave Chappelle alone, lift up trans people. I mean, you know, let them, you know, be on Netflix, let them be stand up comedians. And there's a lot of funny people out there that just don't have to be, you know, you know, it doesn't matter what sex you are, what sex you think you are. If you're funny, then you should be given an opportunity to, to succeed. And that was, you know, that's a, a very good point about what some people thought Dave's humor went across the line. In my opinion, I didn't, did not think it did. Yeah, I, I'm going to push you a little bit on that. I mean, there there are a lot of people that have viewed those remarks that the, the those jokes as as insensitive and and hurtful and and also not especially funny. Uh, in in that the from a from a trans humor perspective, and the you know can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your about your perspective. Well, uh, Dave Chappelle had been talking about trans people and gay people and, I mean, <clears throat> he, you know, let's face it, Lenny Bruce was very, very inappropriate. He got arrested for it. He went to jail for it. Uh, George Carlin uh, was so inappropriate, the seven words you can't say on television, his went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided in his favor, by the way. Uh, and so you've got people through, throughout history, comedians particularly, I mean, you know, uh, there was not a more vile, incredibly funny person, uh, you know, than, <laughs> I'm not even going to mention it. Uh, Dave Chappelle, throughout his entire, I mean, if you saw the Dave Chappelle show, he made fun of everybody. He makes fun of everybody. He makes fun of himself. He makes fun of blacks and browns and trans and gays. And some people are offended by his humor. And they don't have to listen to him. They don't have to laugh at it. And if they don't think it's funny, humor's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, you know, there's going to be disagreement about it. But 
it's not something new. He did not come up and start talking about trans people just in that last Netflix series. He had been talking about, in, a, in my opinion, humorous, humorously uh, for many, many, many years, including decades probably, at his first Dave Chappelle show. I mean, there are, there are, there are a lot of different opinions on that one. Uh, let me move on so we can get some more, uh, some more questions in. Uh, uh, an online, uh, online questioner asks, uh, going back to the Mark Twain Prize, uh, do you think a cartoonist would ever get the Mark Twain Prize? Uh, that's not out of the question. Uh, you know, the, 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 we pick the people that we pick for the uh, Mark Twain Prize have got to have a, you know, have been in television, stand up, movies, uh, writers. We, you know, we've honored Warren Michaels, for example, for the Mark Twain Prize. He did get the honors. There's very few people who got the honors in the Mark Twain Prize. He's one of them. Carol Burnett's one of them. Uh, Steve Martin's one of them. And David Letterman's one of them. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we want people who also had an incredible impact on those who followed. And so, you know, Gary Trudeau, for example, probably would be a great, sure. uh, on the list of maybe a great uh, The doing very hard to the, right, the Doonesbury. I mean, he's had incredible impact. He's had incredible influence on those who's followed him. And so he's just a person that I just happen to love. And, and, uh, but that could certainly be a possibility. But there's, you know, my list, your list, all of our list uh, are going to be probably 80% the same. So in the, in the book, uh, another question uh, online, if somebody else wants to ask a question who, who's here, please you know, just go up to the microphone. The, the, you, know, you write about comedians you know, telling truth to power. The, you know, what do you think is the role of truth-telling comedy and, and what comedians do you think speak out, you know, speak out in opposition to power best today? I don't know about uh, today. Chris Rock does, uh, Eddie Murphy does, um, Whoopi Goldberg does, uh, Tina Fey certainly does. I mean, just think of her great Sarah Palin. I can see Russia from my backyard. Uh, that's speaking kind of truth to power and being really funny about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, George Carlin, I think, was the greatest example. You know, Will Rogers spoke truth to power. So did Mark Twain. Um, and, and these are incredibly funny brilliant satirist who did speak truth to power. It's important. What is your favorite medium of humor? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. What is your favorite medium of humor? Is it memes, stand-up? Uh, I love stand-up. Uh, you know, the greatest movies of all time is that series of DVDs by Mel Brooks. And uh, the president of the Kennedy Center called me one day and, and Mel, Mel's turned us down three times or four times. She said, hey, Cappy, would you like to have dinner with Mel Brooks? And I'm like, God, are you kidding me? Of course. So the Kennedy Center paid uh, uh, Mel some money to, to show the filming of Blazing Saddles. And then afterwards, he'd speak 90 minutes about the creation and the workings of Blazing Saddles. And so uh, in his contract, Mel said, in the green room, he wants egg salad sandwiches. There was a pyramid of egg salad sandwiches. I mean, I've never seen so many egg salad sandwiches ever. Uh, he also wanted Oreo cookies, a bag of Oreo cookies. He also wanted Lay's potato chips, not Wavy's, my favorite, but real Lay's potato chips and real Coke. He's 95 years old. That should be our diets. Sounds pretty good. Anyway, he's sitting on the couch, and I'm sitting on the piano bench, and we're in the green room, and David Rubenstein's there, and Deborah Rutter is there as well. She's president of the Kennedy Center. David Rubenstein's the chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center. I said, you know, Mel, this is going to take some imagination from the audience online and here. Uh, in Blazing Saddles, there is what is, I'm not going to say it, but there's what they call a number six. I don't know how old you are. You look young, so I don't know if you've ever seen Blazing Saddles or not but it's, it's your homework, and I want to report back, uh, but it's a incredibly, you're talking about somebody that, that makes fun of every single person, bigots, whites, gay, I mean, he, male, male no, nobody was spared, but uh, the 
I said, Mel, you know, you've turned us down three or four times, like the twenty. He said, Yeah, I know. I said, well, We could do the music of Mel Brooks, you know, High Anxiety, Springtime for Hitler, I'm So Tired, I mean, all of his movies. He's got brilliantly funny songs. He said, Well, that's a really good idea. Let me think of it. And I said, Mel, if you don't take the Mark Twain Prize, I'm going to have to do a number six on you. So if you know what the number six is, and I'm not going to tell you because it's very, very inappropriate. He laughed hilariously and spit exile all over my suit. I, I've never watched that suit. I've, I still have it, I think, in some sort of medically, you know, you know, you know, vacuumed pack. Uh, he turned us down two weeks later. So he is somebody that's had incredible impact on uh, on humor. Uh, every, you know, all the, you know, look at Tyler Perry's movies. I mean, it's just pretty amazing uh, the influence that Mel Brooks has had. Uh, the, you know, Adam Sandler's movies. I mean, just, you know, Mel Brooks has been kind of the, he is truly my comedic hero, so. All right, but you, another steel cage match, Mel Brooks v. Dick Van Dyke. Mel Brooks. Well, Dick Van Dyke was, an, you know, we honored him for the Kennedy Center Honors last year, and he's very- Yeah, like you've given him an award, Mel Brooks, no award. Well, we gave him the Kennedy Center Honors. But Dick Van Dyke is a brilliant uh, comedian. Uh, I mean, a uh, 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 actor and, uh, and comedic actor. Uh, but he's, you know, has not. He didn't write anything. I mean, Carl Reiner wrote all the Dick Van Dykes and created the Dick Van Dyke Show. And so, you know, I think Mel would, you know, and also, Mel's feisty and, and Dick Van Dyke's kind of skinny. I don't know. So, well, this is starting, this might be revealing in some ways your answer to the next question. Um, maybe it's about being skinny, but what is the criteria for the, for the Mark Twain Prize? Someone who's made us laugh, someone who's had an incredible career in comedy, uh, someone who's had incredible influence on those who followed, uh, and that's kind of the criteria. Someone who's had an incredible impact on our, on our society and our culture and brought joy to our lives. That's kind of what the Mark Twain Prize is all about. And, and who, who else decides it? Uh, there's, we have a list, uh, and uh, there's a, a guy, kind of the keeper of the list, this guy named Matthew Weiner at the Kennedy Center, and Deborah Rutter, the president, and uh, David Rubenstein and I get together, and we kind of discuss it, and then we go to the, uh, the executive committee, and, and uh, the leadership of the Kennedy Center picks the Mark Twain Prize. Has there ever been a time that you disagreed there's a lot of uh, disagreements uh, when we're in the, the picking stage, uh, you know, and we try to be careful to make sure that we, you know, we honor men and women uh, and we honor, we have people of color that we, that we honor. It's incredibly important that we've got, you know, there's just not one group of people that's funnier than another group. Uh, but so we really try to make it, uh, we, we really try to make it a, uh, over the years, we have made it a, a, a good diversified group of, of great people. We now have a question from Richard Perry. Uh, maybe less well known about you is your uh, oh, no. album that you put out called Pure Vanity. I was wondering if you could perhaps uh, share with the audience uh, either some yodeling or one of your favorite songs, uh, just to give them a, a vision of how multi-talented you actually are. You know, that's a problem that, you know, one of my lifelong friends asking me a question because he knows too much about me. For my 50th birthday, I'm at Bob's Steakhouse, uh, two months before my 50th birthday, my college roommate, Bob Kaminsky says, do uh, you have anything you regret? Now we're drinking that wine pretty good, by the way. I said, yes, I've never done my country album. I've got the name for it. He goes, uh, well, what is it? I said, pure vanity. He said, oh, okay. So I don't think anything of it. The next day, he calls me and said, where are your songs? You're going to send me eight songs. I said, oh, well, you know, okay, that, Bob, it's, I've got 10 of your friends, 10 of your friends. We've, we've hired the greatest musicians. Uh, Lee, Leanne Rimes is still guitarist. Uh, Deborah McClinton's head guitar. I mean, it's just an unbelievable group of people. So I went in, recorded my, my uh, for four weeks, uh, my Pure Vanity album, and that was my... Uh, my gift at my birthday party to give away his birthday favors. So 
Then Ken Burns comes into my life. I've, I've been on the National Archives for 17 years, and uh, my very first meeting, Ken was sitting right next to me, and I made him laugh. And if I make you laugh, then we're bonded for life. I mean, it's just like seals or, you know, maybe penguins or I don't know, but anyway, we're bonded. And so uh, Ken, I give Ken, Ken's staying with me about 10 years ago in Dallas with Jenny and me, and uh, we have dinner. He doesn't drink wine at all. He doesn't drink at all. And I, he's got a photographic memory. I think that's why he's been so successful. I drink quite a bit, uh, wine that is. Uh, so I'm, I'm telling him, I said, you know, Ken, you need to do the music of America. And he goes, like, what are you talking about? I did jazz. I said, yeah, okay, jazz, you did jazz. I said, but that's not the music of America. I've seen your, I've seen your documentary. You need to do country music. And he goes, I said, you start with Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, you do the Carter family, you do Hank Williams, and then you end it with, uh, with uh, Waylon Jennings, the Dream of My Dream album, and Willie Nelson, uh, the fair, uh, Phases and Stages, or you would not have Garth Brooks. He said, well, that's interesting. So I'm cooking breakfast for him the next morning. He comes down. He said, we're, to, we're doing country. So then we let's pass, you know, go forward four years. I'm in New York. Ken's in New York. He says, listen, I've just interviewed Dolly Parton. I'd like for you to come down and see Dolly Parton interview. I said, great. So one of the songs on the, it's a Jimmy Rogers song. One of the songs that I sing in Yodel, by the way. Uh, but one of the songs is, is Mule Skinner Blues. It's one of the incredible songs that uh, Jimmy Rogers wrote. And I'm seeing Dolly Parton's interview. She said, the quintessential country song, every country artist sings it, is Mule Skinner Blues. So after I see it, I said, Ken, you know, I sang Mule Skinner Blues on my album since I gave you the idea for country music. You should use my version of Mule Skinner Blues. And the album, he goes, uh-huh. And so uh, about a month later, I actually started this board uh, called the Better Angel Society, which we raise money for all of Ken's films. So I see him at a board meeting. I said, Ken, did you get my, I sent you that Mule Skinner Blues and an email. Did you get that email? He said, I did. I said, well, I never heard from him. He goes, I know. <laughs> so I was not in the film, but he was nice enough to uh, give me credit for giving me the idea, which I appreciate. But Richard, thank you so much for, no, 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 this, no, no, this, no, 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 I, I, no, 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 later, 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 later. No, that's it. That's no more. No more. That's it. Well, no other your other person. <laughs> so being a young is not well world is not world peace. Okay, I mean that, that, but it, but it does bring a smile. Well, let me let me uh, uh, for my last substantive question before we wrap up. Let me take you out with uh, uh, actually a question about the world, which is that the Mark Twain Prize is focused on American comedians. Right. And, you know, curious, you know, when you not not suggesting that the that the award should change, you know, that's the purpose of the award. But there, there are plenty of funny people that are not Americans. You know, who you know, what are maybe what's in maybe an example of two uh, or somebody you think is a great comedian from, you know, not you know, wouldn't qualify for the Mark Twain Prize. Uh, well, Lauren Michaels, we honored him. He's Canadian. Uh, and we've honored someone else who was also Canadian. Um, but. You know, humor, you know, it's called the Kennedy Center Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. Uh, and we have the same issue actually with the honors. When, you know, the honors is we generally honor people who are Americans, but we did honor Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, we, we have honored uh, other people in the past that were not American. You know, we honored Placido Domingo. I mean, we've honored a lot of people that were not Americans. And the same thing with the Mark Twain Prize. You know, there are incredible Indian comedians uh, that have had really wonderful movies here. So obviously, you know, that, that would be a certainly departure, but it is called the American Prize for Humor. It's not to say that nobody else in the world is funny because every, every civilization, every culture, every state, every city, they have comedians. And, uh, you know, President Biden made the point. He said, uh, you know, all you comedians out there, if it wasn't for the Second Amendment, you know, you guys would be put in jail. I put all you guys in jail or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, you can't, you know, we have freedom of speech here in this country. And, and uh, I did two, we did two, uh, uh, actually we did two wonderful dinners at the Supreme Court 
and you got all these comedians standing up honoring. We honored Bill, uh, Billy Crystal uh, on the 10th anniversary, and we honored Bill Murray, uh, you know, in the in, in the second uh, Supreme Court. But you know, they get up and and they do speak truth to power because we do have freedom of speech here in this country, and nobody's censored. Well, it seems like a good note to uh, to wrap up on. We are we are out of time, but I, I wish we could go. Uh, further, uh, a thank you to all of our amazing co-sponsors for making this event happen. The, uh, the Padilla Program, the Andrea Mitchell Center, Penn Live Arts, Penn Theater Arts, and the Center for Programs to Contemporary Writing. And I hope everyone would join me again in thanking uh, Cappy. Uh, check out his Thanks. book. The, the man that made Mark Twain famous. There are copies uh, back there if you want to check it out uh, after, uh, after the event. You'll be able to find this event uh, on the World House uh, YouTube account within uh, a day or two. You can follow uh, World House on all varieties of social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, at Perry World House. Uh, this is our last uh, World Today of the semester. It has been uh, certainly uh, a weird semester with, with, with the, all of the sort of in-betweenness of what events have looked like. Even but, weirder, ending with me. Are you kidding? What better way to end than with a funny guy? <laughs> and the, and we're, but it's been so exciting to have people back in World House to feel the energy here. And we are super excited to uh, welcome everybody back uh, again next semester. Uh, as well. So for all the students in the audience are uh, online, uh, good luck uh, with the rest of classes and studying for finals, and we will see you all in January. Thanks again for having me.